a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engineered Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast. In this podcast, we cover topics such as engineering, artificial intelligence, neuroscience, and other interesting topics to educate, inspire, and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host, Yusuf, and for this episode of the podcast, I'm very excited to welcome Michael Kennedy to my show. Michael is the founder and host of two successful Python podcasts, Talk Python to Me and Python Bytes. He runs Talk Python Training, which provides best-of-class online courses for Python developers. He is deeply involved in the Python community, is a MongoDB master, and knows the thing or two about .NET as well. Michael has taught over 100 week-long developer training courses spread across four continents. He has spoken at a number of US and international conferences including NDC, Software Design and Development, Dev Week, Software Architect and more. You can find him online via Twitter where he is at mkennedy, on GitHub as Mike C. Kennedy, his personal blog at blog.michaelckennedy.net and of course via his podcast at talkpython.fm and pythonbytes.fm. In this really interesting podcast, Michael and I talked about fascinating concepts in programming, tools that you need for programming, tools at each stage of your programming journey, how to enhance your problem-solving skills, and much more. For updates on upcoming podcasts, projects, and videos, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well as on Instagram. To join my weekly newsletter, engineeredmind.sh, where I share exclusive content, visit yusef.substack.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with Michael Kennedy. Michael, welcome to my show. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, you've been doing the show for a while. It's, I've been watching it. It's, it's a good one. So it's an honor to be here with you. I appreciate it. It's an honor for me as well, because I think how many downloads does your podcast have? Talk Python podcast and the we, Python Bytes? We just passed. Yeah, yeah. We just passed uh, 20 million for one and 6 million for the other. And uh, it's yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah. But I've been doing it for five years, right? So it's it's been going along. Yeah. I mean, for, for the people who are not familiar with who you are and what you actually do, can you give us like a one minute crisp bio of who Michael is and what he does? Sure. Uh, I'll go a little bit farther back in history for your audience. I think it's relevant. So I, when I was in college, I was working on my PhD in math and was really interested in researching things around math, but always loved computers. And I got into some research projects through MATLAB and then ultimately C++ and like some supercomputer type things where I le- taught myself programming and realized actually as I went along, I was enjoying the programming more and the math less. And so I, you know, I come from a sort of science engineering background uh, in that regard. And, but I've been programming for many years. I really, really think it's a, a cool thing to do, even if it's not your main job. One of my things that I go around and I speak to people a lot about, or one of the ideas I try to promote a lot is that programming is a superpower to to amplify what you really care about. So if you're really into mechanical engineering, if you had a little bit of programming, you could do so much more than if you just rely on the pre-built tools and, and things like that. So I, I think it's just such a great time to be doing these types of things. And I've been basically advocating and educating around that kind of stuff. So I've been running the podcasts, interviewing people, telling these stories, as you know, and on top of that, I have an online training company. So if people hear stuff on the podcast, they're like, that's awesome. Now, how do I do it? Well, so I've been building courses over the last four or five years to help people you know, actually turn interest and excitement into these superpowers. Mm-hmm. That's I so guess exciting. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. It's so super exciting. Thanks for, for sharing that. And also, of course, I will put the links to your courses down in the description. <laughs> Thank um, you. And they can check it out. The quality is it's like top notch and compared to other courses on Udemy, which are also good. But I think you deliver the whole package. I think you have, you as a person have 21 courses on your page. Uh, probably. Only from the overall you. platform. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For me personally and from the platform, I think we, we might have 30. I'm, I'm, I've got a couple more in, yes. in process, in editing. And so it depends when this comes out. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much right. I, I basically about four years, four or five years ago, quit my job and made it my mission to just start building these courses for people. And it's, it's 
my full-time job. Yeah, I love the idea. We'll talk about this entrepreneurship kind of thing at a later point in the podcast. Um, what I also want to touch on is what was the most exciting journey for you in terms of programming? Like, was it when you were younger? Or is it, Man, does it become yeah. a better journey or cooler journey you, when you become more experienced? How is it for you? Yeah, it's, it has different chapters. It has different experiences and different feelings. So uh, still, I, I think one of the coolest experiences though I had was my first programming job. And I still remember it was not a, a fancy place. It was in Southern California, but it was like this sort of beige room, no windows, <laughs> sitting here at this computer, but just thinking, oh my gosh, I, they're paying me to, to sit here and program. It's no longer a hobby. It's like, I've somehow crossed over into this world where, you know, amazingly it's my job. And I just remember how satisfying and how scary it felt at the same time. I'm like, okay, this thing they asked me to do, I can't believe it, but I can do it. But if they asked me to do anything else, maybe I can't do it at all. And I was really worried. Right. But it was also so much excitement and the things I was doing was quite simple. Uh, it was actually around eye tracking and uh, like visualizing what people were looking at in real time. It was really fun. But the, the work I was actually doing was not that advanced, I guess, but I was just so excited about it. And then as you go through your career, you have these different moments, right? Like the first time I got to speak at a, a conference was really wild. Like the first time I was a guest on a podcast was really, really neat and interesting. And so they're all different. I don't know if it gets better because sometimes you know that that first step from zero to one often in, in some sort of journey is so much more powerful than like 10 to 11. Mm -hmm. what, what what's the most incredible concept for you when it comes to programming let's talk about programming first like where you heard about this concept or any concept where you said okay this is like incredible mind-blowing for me data structures um like computational stuff so um One of the areas that we did a lot of work with, this is well in the the math and science side of programming. These days I do sort of web APIs mm -hmm. and, and like real time video education as a service. Like these, these types of things do not involve fancy mathematics or anything like that or any real engineering other than I guess you can call software engineering, right? But not like hard science stuff. But this this back quite a while ago, we were building we were actually taking something that was prototyped in MATLAB and converting it over to, I think it was C sharp at the time was the language. Anyway, we were converting it over and it was supposed to run in real time. It was using wavelet decomposition. I don't know if you know that, but it's like a, a more advanced Fourier, fast Fourier transform, but, but discrete with, it was, it's crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, we were taking something that was using wavelet decomposition and in, in MATLAB and converting that over to custom code that we were writing. And in the end we had like five, 6,000 lines of code. And the, the tricky part was it had to run in real time. So it had to process results 250 times a second, 250 mm -hmm. Hertz. If it didn't, it wasn't going to work. It just, it had to go that fast or, or we're not going to have answers. You know what I mean? Uh, it's not going to be real time. And I remember, When we first ran it, it was quite a bit slower than it needed to be. I was like, oh my gosh. And we had just written all this code and it was like at the limit of our understanding, right? I did not want to debug it. I didn't want to touch it. I'm like, it works, but I barely know what this is doing. So we cannot make it better by changing stuff, right? And And I used a profiler, which is a program that looks at all the lines of code and says, how much time are you spending on each one? And what blew me away was 80% of the time was on one line of code. We had to go to a, a list, like an array type thing, and find certain items and then compare them. And it was the finding the items that was 80% of the time. I mean, we we're doing like 6,000 lines of super advanced mathematics. And that was like nothing. It was just the finding the items. And so all we had to do is switch from a list to a dictionary where we could look up items by the key instead of by searching through the list for them. The program went five times faster. It's crazy. It was easily, with, it was easily within four milliseconds a, a, a round and boom, we were off to the races. And you know, you, you look at this thing and you're like, this is insanely complicated. 
I, I've worked so hard and I barely understand it. And then it's, it's this one silly little thing. Like I, I used a list. I should have used a dictionary. We're good. <laughs> you know, it's, and it just makes you realize you have these real interesting challenges, but it's not always about like the complexity that you add or the challenges that you add. You just got to sort of know what your tools are a little bit better. Like I didn't really appreciate what the advantage of one over the other was at the time, but now I do, <laughs> you know, that memory, that, that lesson stuck. Like I didn't forget that because yeah. that was such an easy fix to such a scary problem. Yeah. But I think once you solve the problem, even by yourself without like having to look it up or someone else telling you the solution, I think this is such a wonderful feeling. I know it from experience, yeah. like when you find the solution by yourself, this is like an incredible feeling. And um, when we talk about tools, because you mentioned, let's think mm. about program as some kind of tooling. When people get started with Python or any other programming language, let's talk about Python in particular, what tools should they use? Especially if, let's say we start with Git, like version control system. Yeah. What, sure. what else would you recommend to them? Well, I think there's a suite of tools that you should have. I think sometimes people want to start with really simple text editors and they want to start with simple text editors because they feel like I want a simple experience. I don't want all this complicated things. I want a real simple experience to keep things nice and easy. Um, maybe it's Jupyter Notebooks as well. But what I find is a lot of these tools, they, they don't su provide enough support. What I mean is, you know, maybe somebody says, well, I'm going to use Notepad++, right? Okay, so you start typing and like that, that's a tool that will, will sort of give you a little bit of help, but it maybe doesn't understand like these three files linked together in this way. And if you type it's actually referring to this thing. So we you know what the answer is and you just gotta, gotta type it out, right? So I feel like a lot of people sort of fumble along with writing code instead of using powerful editors that can write, write it for you, right? So sort of a rule that I have is if you're typing out variables and things that those can do, if you're typing more than three characters to, to get that section to do something, you're probably not using the right tool, right? So if it's, you know, you're talking to some database, you're like a data layer and it says like, there's a function that says, you know, create new user, you should be able to type CNU and that like just writes the whole rest of that for you, <laughs> you know, or CRE and the create is right there, pick it, right? And so I would really encourage people to use like proper editing tools. So in the PyCharm, sorry, the Python world spa space, I would say PyCharm and VS Code are probably the two tools that you want. You got to install the tooling within VS Code. Um, yeah, it isn't, it isn't you, just yeah. just to interrupt you here with PyCharm. I think it isn't too straightforward because you have a special class on your website for PyCharm specifically, right? Mm, yeah, the thing is, it's easy to make it do twenty percent of what it does, but it has all these features that like nobody knows about or nobody uses. Uh, but once you know them, they're, they're pretty awesome. So I think a, a, picking a good editor is a really important thing to do. And I wouldn't shy away from, you know, spending an hour or two to just become familiar with better tools because it'll pay off. Exactly. Definitely. I think also there's a few just programming ideas that you should invest a little bit of time in that, that, that don't take a lot. And we could touch on what those are. I do think that source control is super, super important. And you mentioned Git. Mm -hmm. Git is what I use. I, I used to use Subversion, but obviously the entire world has moved to Git, mostly because of open source, right? Um, Git is one of those source control systems that's distributed, which means I can go find a project that's interesting, make sort of a, a remote clone of it or a local clone of it that I can work on. And then if I want to contribute back, I can push it back, as opposed to the traditional ones where you have to ask permission to work on a project at all. But I feel like Git can be pretty scary, especially if you're not coming from the com uh, computer science side. You go and look and say, okay, I need to learn Git apparently. I, I really need to get into source control. I know that's something I need to do. But you go and look on YouTube, you go look for some courses and there's all these complicated command line commands people are typing. 
and it's fine until it doesn't work. Then you go, oh, now I've got to merge this. Or I've got like, there's all these challenges. You're like, oh, this is so frustrating. Um, why can't, why do I have to do this? So what I would encourage people to do is there's some really nice UI tools for working with Git, right? In like a real simple way. So four that come to mind, I guess real quick is uh, GitHub itself has a desktop yeah. application, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's pretty nice. I don't use it at all, but uh, I've used it before, but I don't use it currently. There's uh, one called uh, Source Tree, mm -hmm. which is really nice. That's the one I use. It's a little more advanced, but it does everything that you would possibly ever want to do in the command line in a UI, which is nice. And it has hotkeys and whatnot, which is cool. Um, and then I mentioned those two editors, VS Code and PyCharm. They both have really good Git integration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like for example, I was I was looking through the C Python source code. This is the source code that that is the program that is Python. Like when you run Python, this is the thing that it is written in. That's actually written in C. And for some random reason, uh, I was digging down into the internals of it with VS Code. And actually in VS Code, it'll show you on every function it'll put like a little gray line that says who did what to this thing last without even typing. And so you can see like Guido von Rossum, uh, you know, added, made this change to it in like 1997 or something. You're like, wow, how interesting. <laughs> Look at the history you see of like this old complicated project mm -hmm. as you go through it, right? So, you know, the, the fundamental problem that you solve with something like get any sort of source control is, you know, I'm sure many people who are getting into programming have done this or have seen this done is, if you, you want to make a change to your program, but you, you've got it working, right? And you're like, oh, I really don't want to touch it. It's working. Uh, I want to try re changing this stuff around, but, but it's working. And so what you end up with is a, like maybe the file three or four times, like version one, version two, version three, or like a zip file of the project with like a date or something, you know, and just that way of organizing, it's, it's not ideal right yeah. and if you if you put it into source control you can just go into these tools and go go back to the way it was you know yesterday or show me how it's changed from this time to that time and it gives you this fearlessness to explore and to try so you can just say you know what i'm going to make sure it's committed to source control and then i'm just going to go do crazy stuff and if it goes wrong yeah right click revert and it's boom it's right back to the way it was or you can create a branch and just go crazy and go you know what that branch is no good or it didn't go where i want put it away, uh, go back to the original, right? There's just this, this ability to just try things out without consequence that you get to adopt once you pick up some of these source control tools. So Git, I think is great. It's a little scary because it has all these different commands and multiple stages to get anything done. But with the UI, it makes it pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to add one more UI, which I use, it's called Git Kraken. Or Kraken. Yeah, Git Kraken's pretty good. Yeah, I like the UI because I ca I'm kind of a design freak. So that's what I like. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's really nice. I, I haven't used Git Kraken lately. I did try it previously, but uh, I haven't used it. Yeah, this is a good one as well. Yeah. When it comes to the toolbox, Michael, what would you also recommend for beginners or even intermediate or so sometimes even advanced users, which they should use but don't use often, a lot of times? Sure. I think it depends where you are in your sequence of... of learning to program yeah. or using using code right um in the early days it's about organization right and especially with python it's really easy to say i'm going to just do these five steps and so you create a, a program.py and you type line one line two line three line four line five and it runs but there's no way to vary what you do there's no way to reuse it or to try different inputs to it or something, right? It's just this script. You know, I saw this a lot in my, when I was programming, and I told you that first job, it was at a company that was full of PhD researchers. So they would create all these, these scripts and they were pretty good at programming and things like MATLAB and stuff, but they weren't good at building like libraries and, and tools. It was, I, I got it to, to take in the data and give me the answer, right? So, so real simple core concepts like create a function so that I can pass in different information and reuse it or instead of having you know 
a hundred line long thing that does the whole thing, break it into little pieces because you might be able to reuse those pieces or, you know, maybe step five and go, it'd be really cool if we could try wavelet decomposition instead of fast Fourier analysis on this or, you know, some random thing like that, right? Like maybe we could try a different um, algorithm to pull out the features at this step, right? And if you broke it into the right pieces, I think that that's, that's it. Um, another area, I guess, that sort of meta tools or something like that that I would recommend is something called awesome-python.com. Are you familiar with this? I heard of it, but I never used it, to be honest. Yeah, so what Awesome Python is, is it is a like a catalog of well-known, popular libraries for Python. Mm -hmm. So you go over there and you just say, um, you pull up different things. So on the right, there's all these categories. So, um, you know, I could come over here and say, I'm interested in data visualization or I'm interested in, um, you know, GUI development or, or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. you click on it and it pulls up, oh, here's the five or 10 most popular libraries that you can just install and use. Oh, uh, yeah, I so, see, yeah. Right? So if you're looking for engineering or something like that, right? It you know, says, oh, you should go check out SciPy. There's a whole bunch of like yeah. libraries there for mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, right? Um, so I think that it's not one tool or one library, but it's it's a way to go find them when you don't know, because that's one of the challenges. It used to be, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the challenge is finding anything that works. I'm just, you know, I need a library that does this and right. Maybe the web just barely existed. People were still learning through books. There were no video courses. There was no stack overflow. It's like, I need to find something at all. And now with these package managers that you have for these different programming languages, like, PyPI for or PIP for Python or NPM for JavaScript, the problem has become a problem of like abundance or, or too much, right? So if I want to go find a library for Python, there's 300,000 of them now. And as a beginner, I might find 50 things to do, you know, like web scraping. Well, which of the 50 things is any good? How should I, you know, what should I pick and so on? So places like Awesome Python that sort of rank them and put them in there. Um, stuff only gets put into that list if it's been suggested by a certain number of people and it's got a certain amount of like usage and stuff like that. So it's it's not perfect. Not everything there is, you know, amazing or whatever, but it's it's much better than jumping into 300,000 disconnected things and saying, now where do I start? Definitely. I appreciate the, the input, Michael, here. Um, I yeah. also want to talk about a, a very interesting topic, which is like how, how I solve problems. Oftentimes when I, for example, watch YouTubers just to see, for example, how they make the video or just talk mm -hmm. about Python in general, they say practice is key. But the thing is, sometimes when we see a solution, especially when we are in the beginner mindset, we think, OK, I have the solution here. That's also the way I would have done it, right? But yeah, how, yeah, yeah. how can we practice, like excluding practice now uh, out of this yeah. of parameter space, how can we improve our uh, problem solving skills like besides practicing only? Yeah, I did a really interesting episode over on Talk Python called Beginners and Experts. So I had a panel of beginners who all of whom I think had just gotten their first job or just got their degree or, or something like that. And then a couple of experts. And it was really interesting to talk to them, especially the beginners. You know, it's so often I think it's, it's almost like a writer's block problem. You know, it's the equivalent of I need to write a paper and I have a blank word processor and I have no idea even how to get started, right? And it's the same thing for, for programming, right? You get, you just open an editor and it's just blank. You're like, okay, I... I just don't know, right? If you see the answer, you're like, that's really beautiful. How would I have known to get from nothing to here? And one of the things that was interesting was there are a bunch of techniques which you can apply to get a little bit better at, at making those steps. But one of the real differences between beginners and experts is not that the experts are really super smart necessarily and the beginners are, are not. It's not about that. It's once you've seen a problem that's similar solved, you're like, oh, 
This is a lot like that. And that's how we solve this. And here's what worked well and what didn't, or here's how it's different. So we'll just do this thing. What we need to do is when to create a SQL alchemy layer, it's going to talk to this. And then here we're going to have this API and then boom, it's done. Right. And that's, that's sort of pattern matching from experience. So the reason I bring that up is going through those lessons, just building up those things. It's really hard the first time, it's a little bit hard, like a little bit less hard the next time, but eventually you, you get this sort of library of patterns, not programming patterns, but just like, I've seen that problem solved in another program or another library. Yeah. And I think it's like this, that doesn't help you go from zero to one. Right. Um, so some of the problem solving techniques I think you can talk about are you know, really, really trying to break them up. One of the things I find is really helpful is if I've got to write a program, well, you know, it kind of is going to have a couple of steps first, you know, it's, uh, let's imagine I'm going to play tic-tac-toe. I want to create a game that plays tic-tac-toe against a computer, just text, right? So you might think, well, how do you play tic-tac-toe? I don't know. So what are the steps? Well, it's going to be, I need to ask the user, you know, maybe what their name is so I can address them or have them start a new game. And then I need to show the empty board or show the board, which is going to be empty. And then I'm going to need to get a position. I'm going to need to make sure that they're not trying to play somewhere else. Maybe have, then, then switch players. If it's the computer, it's got to play. If it's the human it's got to ask them for their play and then put it in the right spot and then i got to check for a win and when they win it's over right so you sort of think through this process and what i find is like i like to write those out in comments in the code okay ask user for a name you know create board uh, you know wh gotta, while yeah. like go around until they haven't uh won you know at, get get play from player right maybe if it's the real human ask them if it's a computer just use randomly to guess um, check that they can play that. And then once you have it written down, like none of those are particularly hard. Well, like in Python, ask user for name is input, <laughs> quote, <laughs> what's your name? <laughs> Let's put that in a variable, right? Uh, get a random play from the, the computer is random <laughs> dot <laughs> rand int for mm -hmm. the size of the board. You know, like no, none of those are really super, super hard. But what you end up with is you're not solving a somewhat big problem, at least big when you're a new developer or new, new to programming, what you're solving is five or six small problems. And those small problems are much more approachable. Yeah. Got it. That reminds me a bit of how I approach videos lately, like not just talk into the camera, but really having a script and then knowing actually what you want to talk about. Yeah. That's, that's very useful. Um, yeah. And it's not having the answer. It's just having like an idea of where you're going and it really helps focus the mind. Exactly. Yeah. It's so simple, but yet so, yet so effective. Um, yeah. Well, one thing I also want to touch on because I'm guilty of that, because when I started programming in MATLAB, I used to do this a lot is writing the whole code in one script. No, yes. fu no functions, no <laughs> multiple yep. files. Um, is it also something you see, uh, beginners doing when, uh, Maybe, you know, when, when you give classes. Yeah, 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 sure. I just, I would say it is something that you see because you're just focused on, on doing those steps. All right. I just need to get from here to there. So let's just like, what do I got to do to, to make those steps happen? I would say what I just described, those sort of laying out things, those almost are the functions. Those are the parts of the program that you should create. Almost every one of those makes a lot of sense to be its own little function within a larger program. So I think that you can put those things together. You know, one of the things that I find is people feel like, Oh, I, I did it wrong. Or I, I went down the wrong path or whatever. And between the, the modern editors and version control, like software can be changed so easily. So for example, if you find, well, I wrote all this and then I have the while, and then I've got a bunch of stuff happening in the while. And then I go on and like in PyCharm, you just highlight the stuff in the while and you say extract method, it asks for the name and it automatically figures out the arguments and then it writes it. So you can do it one way and they go, oh, it would be better if this was in smaller pieces. But I think one of the lessons that people learn as they go, many people learn anyway, is it's so much easier to write small little pieces that are self-contained. So if you, as you go through it, you're like, oh, this is starting to feel too big. There's this really interesting idea that just when I learned about it, it just blew my mind called code smells. Have you heard of this idea? No. 
Please explain. So, yeah, so code smells, right? It comes from Martin Fowler back in 1991. He wrote this book called Refactoring, mm -hmm. which is about restructuring your code with not with, without really effective, affecting how it runs, right? Maybe slight memory or like slightly uh, different performance, but it really is about just restructuring it so it does the same thing, but it's more understandable. And the question is, when should you do that, right? Because you could just do that stuff all day long and not get anything done, just like shuffling paper around or whatever. But you should have some sort of guide. And the guide that he came up with were these ideas called code smell. And it's, it's when you look at a piece of code and it's, it's not wrong, it works, it runs, but it just makes you go, ugh, ew, yuck. There's something wrong with this, right? And he actually lays them out and gives them names. So like long method, too many arguments, um, uh, all sorts of like complexity, like too much indentation, right? And when you see that, you're like, oh, we're, it's not broken. It still works, but it's, it's kind of going bad. You can tell that it's not, it, it's just not quite right. And so then actually, if you study those code smells, it says, and here's the fix. Here's what you do when it's too long. You break into other functions. If there's too many arguments, you create a class and you put the properties on the class and you pass the one class and things like that. So it's a really interesting idea how to do it. And the, probably the most interesting thing that comes from all that is this, this idea of code comments. So, so often people say, you should comment your code and you should go in here and you should write, I'm doing this here and this is why I'm doing it and so on. But he also had an interesting idea and I use this, I guess this, this is the guide that I, I use for myself to answer your question in a long way <laughs> is he says that these code comments often are deodorant for code smells. So if something looks bad, instead of fixing it, a lot of times people will put a comment like this is really messy because X, Y, and Z. You're like, or we could just make it not messy and it wouldn't need a comment, right? So if there's a really complicated section in my tic-tac-toe bit and I put a comment, well, the reason we're doing this is sometimes the AI is playing and sometimes the human is playing and then we get their answer, then we have to check if they've done a correct place. That could be a comment. Or <laughs> you could just write, if AI get AI play, else get human play. And if you had that, if AI get AI play, else human, that doesn't need a comment because it's, it's so small and it's well-named, it's built out of well-named elements, right? And so for me, I use this idea of code smells that if I go along and I, especially this comment, if I find myself writing comments to explain what something is, like why something is not obvious, I just often delete the comment and go, okay, how can I redo this so that I would not want to write that comment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes absolute sense. Beautiful yeah, concept. Certain time yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So uh, there's certainly times when you need a comment. Like this is this seems weird, but because we're talking to this database that's unreliable, we have to do this thing that's not obvious. But please don't change it because like there's really reasonable times to put comments like that or other other stuff. But so often it's oh, this is starting to feel really complicated and hard and not obvious. So let me explain what's happening. When so often the answer is don't explain it. Just figure out a way to make it more small pieces that make more sense. And then you would go like, why would I write a comment? Like it's it, the comment just says what it's doing. So obviously that the comment doesn't make sense. So that's, that's my guide for knowing uh, sort of how should I not have one huge program? Cause eventually you'll have that, that your nose will sort of wrinkle up. You go, Oh, ooh, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And then, then you can apply one of these fixes. Mm -hmm. Like with all the tools we see, for example, if you're on Twitter, on whatever, Instagram, and people promoting, yeah, sh you should learn this, you should learn that. And even people approaching me when they start learning MATLAB, for example, I want to del delve into programming. Okay, what can I ignore? So I'm asking yeah. you, Michael, what can I ignore? We have these things like Docker um, and all these kind of things. What should people yeah. ignore to really focus, have laser focus in their uh, programming career? Sure, sure. Well, I think Docker is probably one. I, I think Docker is really interesting. It solves some amazing problems, mm -hmm. but it's it's not something you have to jump right into. I would say if in the very early days you end up using Docker, it's more like I want to run something complicated on my system so I can like work with it or develop against it. 
And instead of trying to set it all up, I just want to run a Docker image that runs it. But do, do you need to create different containers and use Kubernetes? No, you don't need to do that. Like you can do actually, but it's, it's not necessarily where you should start. Mm -hmm. What else can I tell you? Test driven uh, development. Yes, you can. <laughs> uh, I, I think there's value to it, but I, I think test-driven development, is, it sounds simple, but it's actually advanced. Now, that doesn't mean I think you should absolutely not write any tests at all. Mm -hmm. But I think people often hear you got to do test-driven development and you got to do 100% code coverage or you're doing it wrong, right? You got to write the test first and you got to cover everything. And when re in reality, like many programs have all sorts of little parts that are kind of irrelevant. They're needed. Like imagine a standard UI application, right? It has an about box that says, what the name it is, what the version it is, when it was released. You don't ever need to test anything about that ever <laughs> as a beginner. Like there's no reason to even like think about it. Uh, the part that like maybe logs out stuff, like you don't forget that stuff. There's some internal thing. So the way I like to think about it is, is that the thing that you're like, if this was a product, if you were selling it, maybe that thing should be tested. The thing that if it doesn't work, they're like, this really was the core. It had one job and it failed type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So if I was building, say, um, a trading engine at a bank, the part that actually does the stock pricing and trading, that I would probably eventually write some really good unit tests for, right? But sort of extra stuff, maybe, maybe not. I mean, at a bank probably you would, but, you know, like there's, there's a kernel of, the thing that is what it's one job is supposed to be like, maybe think about testing that, but don't go all in like, especially in the beginning, eventually you can decide what that, that line yeah. where that lives is. Yeah. So let's see microservices, you know, microservices mm -hmm. are a way to build a bunch of little APIs that talk to each other so they can all just do one thing. Um, that used to be all the rage. First we wrote programs that were just all one thing. <laughs> but it would got hard to like have different people. Like a lot of the pressure for these kinds of ideas came from, I've got a team of people, like 15 people working on this program. Uh, and I want to hire a new person who's not very skilled and let them make changes to it. But they're not necessarily not skilled. They're not familiar with the intricacies of this thing. And I want to let them make changes to it, but make it easy for them to learn. If they make changes to the whole thing, they might break it and so on. Yeah. So let's, let's break into little pieces and they can work on just that little piece that's much more small and isolated, understandable. But what you end up doing is you end up building like really quite complicated infrastructure juggling stuff, right? So you've moved like software complexity to like managing 10 servers that all know about each other and talk to each other and um, that you don't want to do. Yeah. Have you, have <laughs> maybe, you? Maybe if you're like Netflix, but not if you're, uh, you know, Sarah, a new developer of three months. She yeah. shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. yeah. Do you have these topics we uh, we just discussed in one of your courses? Like we discussed Docker, test driven development, microservices. Do you have them covered in your courses in case someone is interested in? Yeah. I uh, don't really have microservices, mm -hmm. but the others uh, we we do. We have a course called 100 Days of Code. And in there we do some Docker stuff because, okay. you know, but it's like day 94 or something out of 100, right? It's not, not day two. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, for sure. We also want to talk a little bit about AI, not too much about AI. Um, when we go back to the beginning where we talked about completion and IDEs and PyCharm and all these kind of integrations, have you personally used AI integrations? Like, for example, I recently found one which is called Kite, mm -hmm. where it's, they trained the system, I think, on yeah. GitHub repos, if I'm not mistaken, and then it would actually know what you want to write, not only like a completion, but also even a longer completion. And um, have you tested this? I've done basic, I, I've installed Kite and played with it just a little bit. It is cool. I've not used it as a proper tool. And uh, there's some some other interesting ones. I think Microsoft has something called IntelliCode mm -hmm. in, in VS Code, which uh, I think is similar. Um, and it, it'll like suggest, it'll go through GitHub and say, these are the most common ways this library is used. Mm -hmm. So instead of just showing the things that can do, show what people often do, uh, right? I think, 
I think it's really interesting. You know, I, I talked about if you're typing more than three or four characters, you're probably using the wrong tool, you know, to do like a, like if you're trying to say the function name or a variable name or class name or something. Yeah. Do you personally think, or what do you see the f future of AI going in terms of programming? Do you think AI will be able to program itself or create programs in the future? Is it something you think about? Something I think about, but it's not something I think will happen. I, I don't think that, I don't think like the jobs of developers are going to go away because all of a sudden programmers, you know, have been replaced by, you know, deep learning neural networks with, you know, I don't know, whatever other uh, cool feature that they add to that stuff. I do think AI is utterly amazing. Um, so maybe I shouldn't underestimate it. I, I think, it, but it also, it seems like it's really, really good at certain things and not that good at other things. Yeah, definitely. Right? I think we're, we're so still for example, the, image. Yeah, yeah image exactly. Stuff. Yeah. Um, do you personally think, or what is the most fascinating concept for you in AI when you think about deep learning, machine learning, anything like that? The most fascinating thing for me really is the, the jump that it took. So when I was in college, this is like early 90s, you know, I, I took programming, a couple of programming languages, and one of them was one that was common in AI. And you would hear people talk about AI. And what I, AI meant to people was getting a program to act human-like in some of its thinking. And often it was, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a chat room, and you're going to chat with somebody. Mm. And if the thing that you're chatting with, if you believe it's a human then it's, it's like real, it's like a smart AI. It's, it's made it, right? It's passed the Turing test. Exactly. If you can determine that it's not a, if you can determine it's an AI, then it's kind of failed, right? And that seemed like such a low level of achievement that people were aiming for. It's like, okay, well, who cares if I can, I can chat with a thing and it's somewhat conversational, right? That's, that's really interesting, but it's, it's, It's not that much. And it seemed like it never really progressed very far after that, beyond that. I'm like, well, it's kind of, it seems like maybe this is not going to go anywhere. And then all of a sudden we have neural networks that are, you know, finding cancer in uh, mammogram scans, images better than the doctors. We have Tesla driving a car, like the car drives itself. Yeah. And the, the gap between, Between the car drives itself and I can be in a chat room and I, I'm pretty sure that it's an AI, like those, that, that gap is so huge. And it, I didn't, it seemed like nothing happened in between it. It's like, oh, there's this chat room. People are trying to make the chat room. Oh, the car is driving. Oh, that's amazing. Like, how do we get from one? To, I know how we got there, but it's just amazing that that jump happened. Right. And so to me, it's the, this, I think they really found where AI works. And all those examples I named have something to do with image processing and recognition, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, especially when we talk about Python, you're a Python expert, and the language being so commonly used for AI, I think it's a wonderful place to be, right? Coupling AI yeah. with Python. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's really good for many, many things. I think what's really interesting about Python is it what I call a full spectrum language. And the idea is, I don't know if this is an official term, I just made it up, but there might be some other analogy to it. But the idea is you can get started and you can actually be productive in Python with a very partial understanding of what it is or what it does. And there's not many languages like that. So if I want to do something in C, you got to know a lot about what C does and how it works. Right. If I want to do something in Java, same thing. But if I want to get something done in Python, I can literally create a file, write five, maybe install some libraries, you know, pip install magic, uh, and then write four or five lines, no functions, no classes, no compiling. And I run it and you might get some really amazing, like you put some stuff on a, on a map and here's some like live data on a map. And it's like, that's amazing. And you've used only a few very basic concepts from computer science. You don't have to know what functions are. You don't have classes are. You don't have to know what generators or asynchronous or threads or compilers or linkers or any of like none of that stuff. You even have to know it exists. 
right? And so at the very beginning, you can get started with Python, but it has all of those advanced things besides maybe the, the linker bit, but it has all the advanced computer science ideas and you can slowly adopt them as you progress, as you grow. And I think that's why Python is so popular, especially people coming from the sciences and engineering is you don't have to come and say, I'm going to be a programmer and a computer yeah. scientist. I'm going to learn all the data structures and all the, all the complicated ideas of, of classes and inheritance and interfaces and then go. You can just say, I'm going to do this real simple thing. Or that was cool. Well, what else can I do? Maybe I got to learn a new little idea. Well, now it's even more cool. Now it just kind of keeps building. Uh, so there's this really easy way to get started. The problem most languages that are easy to get started with is they, they have a limit. It's not that high. Like, um, Visual Basic 6, for example, is an amazing way to build quick little UIs, but you would never build like high-end professional <laughs> web services, web platform as a service type things with it or cloud computing things, you know, but Python does, right? Like Python, like YouTube is built in Python. Instagram is built in Python. Like you can scale, you can sort of conceptually scale this all the way to the highest professional levels of programming, but you don't start there. And so I think that that's a really interesting reason that Python is popular, especially in things like AI and data science and generally people coming from scientific computing is you can adopt just as much of it as you need. You don't have to have all the other ideas forced on you. Yeah. And I think one concept we probably miss is the, uh, in terms of performance, should you think about performance in the beginning or is it like you jump into the field and if you need data structures, yeah. you would learn it eventually? Sure. Uh, performance is super interesting, but I'm, I'm never, I, I, let me rephrase it instead of a double negative. I'm always amazed at how fast computers are. And you know, computers are fast, you know, they're doing a lot of things, um, but, but they can really do a lot of things quickly. Like for example, when I was, uh, in the early days of my programming, I did some 3d simulator type development around OpenGL and C++ and I'm, I'm, I'm writing this code and we're like loading up these models and stuff and I'm like, okay, so it's running pretty good. It's running like a hundred frames a second. Then I think for me, I'm like, oh, there's like a hundred thousand triangles with lighting and textures that are moving around a hundred times. It's doing that a second, right? It takes 10 milliseconds to figure out what seems like an insane amount of computation. There's just the amount of, and that was, you know, 20 years ago, right? So the, the amount of processing that these things can do. So I would just say, worry about it when it's a problem. Don't, don't worry about it now. And it's really, you know, like I, my example is sometimes you, you're not using the right library. Sometimes you are the right data structure, right? You should be using something that's fast at lookups, or fast at finding them like by position or whatever you can learn that stuff but just try it see if it works code code is like plastic it's malleable it's like mm -hmm. clay wet clay and so you know try something adapt it try it again try it a different way compare it use the tools like profilers yeah to figure out where it's slow Definitely. Um, also, what I also see in a lot of YouTube comments is, should I now use Python or the other one was uh, Julia, right? I almost forgot mm. the name. <laughs> well, I mean, you're obviously biased. You would probably use Python yeah. any day. Uh, but wh where do you see Julia and this whole kind of infrastructure of programming languages? You know, I, I don't know very much about Julia. What I've seen about it looks pretty interesting. But... They use it a lot for scientific I, computing and it seems to be yeah, a bit, it, bit yeah. faster, they say, than Python. I, I mean, it dep probably depends on the application, but I think they have test cases where they can compare Python and Julia. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that is interesting, have you ever looked at, uh, if you just Google Stack Overflow Trends, have, have you seen those that graph? Uh, I used to plot it at some point in a Jupyter Notebook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Stack Overflow Trends is a place that'll let you compare the relative popularity or, or usage of different languages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just because the language is popular doesn't mean, mean you necessarily should be yeah. using it. 
right? But the fact that it is popular means there will be libraries for talking to all the different databases or all the different file formats. There's probably a way to just say, load this, right? Like I can go to pandas and say, load me an Excel file and boom, now I just have Excel loaded, <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't need to try to figure out how to process all those things. And also, I guess around jobs, right? So if you're looking for jobs or hiring people, all these different things. And if you look at the Stack Overflow trends and you put, well, like Python is like blowing off the chart compared to everything else, which is already pretty interesting. But if you put it next to just Julia, like, like Julia, it looks like the X axis. <laughs> you know, compared <laughs> to, right. So I'm not, I'm not belittling Julia, right? This is not, like I said, it's not popularity is not equal necessarily the, the best, but until a language reaches like a certain level of, of popularity, and if it's still very niche, you don't have a lot of the different libraries and you don't have the different options. The other thing to consider in here, and I can't speak for Julia, I'm pretty sure it falls into this category, but often another one that's brought up is R and other, uh, you know, um, other languages like that is some languages allow you to build like our general purpose programming languages and allow you to build arbitrary things. Whereas others like R and I think Julia are more specifically focused on scientific computing. The thing is, if you build up like some cool library in that thing, in that language, and you decide, oh, this would make a really great website and I want to put it on the internet and make it interactive. Can you do that in Julia? Can you do that in R? Hmm. I know in a constrained way with, um, I can't remember what it's called. It, the, uh, R has some way to do that for a certain like dashboardy type of application, but you couldn't build an arbitrary application in like YouTube. Is it like Plotly? It. Plotly or something like that. Plotly is one of the graphing ones. I think it's like Sparkle or something like that. Ah, I can't yeah, remember right. what it's yeah, called. Yeah, something like yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That. Yeah, but it's, the, so I, I guess the, the other part is the, you want to think about, do you have to switch languages? Right. If you build up like a cool proof of concept in a visualization, but you want to do something slightly different, do you have to completely start from scratch somewhere else or can you just keep going? Right. One of the advantages of Python is you want to put an API where like now your machine learning model is being consumed by like iPhone applications. That's like an afternoon with fast API, you know, and then now it's good. You're, go you're golden or flask or something like that. Uh, and then, and so on. Right. So there's, there's this ability to kind of keep adding on or expanding. Uh, whereas some of the more specialized languages, they're really good at their specialty, but they are in kind of that box forever. Yeah. Um, one last point before we jump to the interesting part of business and before we then wrap things up is, do <laughs> yeah. you think people talk a lot about Go and JavaScript eventually um, substituting Python for machine learning? Do you think these are reasonable languages to substitute Python in the long term? Maybe. Uh, it's, maybe. So I think my feeling when I work with Go which I've done very little with, but it, it is interesting is it is not simple. Yeah. Uh, it's powerful and it does simplify complex ideas. Like asynchronous programming is like in a really, like that's one of its advantages is it really leverages that from the ground up to, to do more stuff at the same time or do it faster. But it doesn't have this full spectrum aspect that I talk about. And I don't see a lot of beginners or like say a biologist who wants to do programming a little bit for her lab. I don't see that person choosing go ever. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, they might as well choose C or rust or something. I mean, they're, they're not, it's close. I would say go is closer to those types of languages than it is to Python. Yeah. Right. And so I think some of the real advantage of Python is this full spectrum bit. Like I can do, I can do just enough, conceptual stuff and complexity stuff as the problem demands. And it only has to grow as much as the complexity of the underlying problem I'm solving. So may maybe Go does. Uh, the thing is, you know, people talk about performance. Like, oh, Go is way faster than Python. And I'm, I haven't tested the two, but I'm pretty sure that that is true. But when people do machine learning in Python, the computation, the execution bits of the machine learning happen in in a C++ layer 
And that C++ layer is usually executing on a GPU. Or maybe on my new Apple M1, it'll execute on the neural uh, processing units. But it's the point is it's not actually happening in Python. Py you could think of Python as like kind of having like little strings into an underlying like high performance layer in C and it just like pulls the strings a little bit, you know, make this thing go, give it that data and let's get the answer, right? So maybe one thing that could happen is maybe that internal bit is written in Go, but then people actually talk to it through Python yeah. more often than not, right? Um, that's very different than JavaScript, right? So I think there might be actually an, um, some potential for the Go and Python to work as layers together. Whereas I think JavaScript is legitimate would be another thing. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Uh, I, I'm going to say probably no on the JavaScript. Mm -hmm. uh, two reasons. One, I, I know JavaScript is super popular, and I know a lot of people are, are doing interesting stuff with it. But JavaScript, for some reason, I don't fully appreciate why, has decided to get more and more and more complex like more formalized and more complex as it goes right you've got a lot of like uh you know include these types of libraries and inject this and you know there's just a lot of stuff that's happening that makes it feel a little bit complicated so i feel like javascript is losing its simplicity on one hand um i i kind of lament that like the days of just i just include a javascript file and and now i can just write some javascript right like with vue.js or something it's, it's a whole lot more, we'll run this sort of like app builder thing and then it's going to create a bunch of stuff that you piece it together and then you import these, li like it just seems to be not so simple anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. that, but that's not the main thing. I think the main thing is JavaScript not supporting uh, integers. And, and some of it's sort of, it's weird math stuff yeah. where like everything is a float and sometimes things really should be not floats. I, I just think that like if you're going to build a, a scientific computation platform it's going to need better number support and you know maybe javascript 7 comes out and says we have integers <laughs> or or something you know what i mean uh but until then I, I would say it's probably not going to take over the other thing is javascript is pretty fast uh, but it's not the same as having a c or a go or a rust 90% of your stuff is like that high performance layer, yeah. right? And po possibly WebAssembly is going to make a change here. Um, you know, WebAssembly is like a compiled binary like JavaScript file basically that runs a little bit differently. But over there you can write stuff in Rust. <laughs> I think that's a primary language for it. And then you could also write it in Python, right? So you, you could see machine learning moving to or data science type stuff moving to the browser but through WebAssembly mm -hmm. and maybe even these other languages. Yeah, that makes absolute sense, Michael. Thanks for the insights here. So yeah. we, we close the topic of uh, the programming itself and want to go to business plus programming. So you're a develop sure. you're a developer slash programmer and you made a living as you as you said in the beginning from making courses. Yeah. Uh, I want you to talk it's about crazy. the yeah it's crazy. <laughs> I want you to talk about a little bit about um how did you come up with the idea to create courses, courses in the first place and then sponsoring even podcasts like the one of mm. my, like myself <laughs> yeah um, thank you to reach financial freedom like this is a very interesting concept because you have the courses built once right they're sitting on the platform and they're somehow money generating machines which is like an incredible yeah. concept it's it's pretty amazing so i did it in multiple layers multiple pieces at a time mm -hmm. So first of all, I created my podcast a year, year and a half before I created the course business. And the podcast was really about reaching people and inspiring people. Along the way, companies came back and started sponsoring the podcast itself, which was a really interesting turn of events that actually made the whole journey easier because all of a sudden I had this other form of income that it was some sort of base level that you know wouldn't necessarily make you rich, but would would give you some support while you work on building the next layer, right? And so my what I saw going through the podcast was really that 
the podcast is great at inspiring people and reaching people. Mm. But once somebody's inspired, they're like, that's awesome. I want to do that. I want to learn that. Then they'd say, well, where do I go? Right? Like I always sort of envisioned creating the podcast and then creating the courses, but it became really clear that, you know, people are really excited about something, but they don't, they've got to go find some way to actually make any use of it. Right. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right, well, I really want to create these courses. It's something I had been doing before I quit the, uh, before I started my own thing, I had done in-person training. So I had some experience at, at teaching developers and what works and what doesn't what's boring, what's interesting and so on. So I'm like, and I just looked around and like, so many people are just not doing this well. Like they're, they're maybe creating YouTube videos, but they're using like their laptop mic. And like the, it's just, the video is so painful to watch. Actually the content is pretty good, but I can't even bear to look at it, you know, cause it just, it's so scratchy and the, the fonts are so small or whatever. I'm like, somebody should really be building like highly produced you know, really polished, edited content, right? Uh, that is in a clear line, not just a bunch of random things that will teach people how to get better at programming. And I didn't see that in the Python space. So I'm like, all right, that's that's what I'm gonna try to do, yeah? This so this is inspiring my life stuff for a moment because this is exactly what I'm thinking about doing MATLAB tutorials in that kind of way. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It's. It's really interesting because if you see people, if you see a gap like that, it's like, I could do that. Yeah. If I just had the time and at the time I was working for a company that did uh, developer training, so I couldn't just do this on the side, right? If I worked, if I was working for an automotive company and I created courses on the side, like maybe they don't care, right? Whatever. As long as it's not during work, keep going. But because I work for a company that did something very similar, I had to quit my job and then try it, which was pretty stressful. So I actually put together a Kickstarter uh, offering the first course, and then I, I announced it to the podcast. And the Kickstarter funded in 12 hours. Whoa. And after 12 hours, I was like, all right, this is gonna work. <laughs> this is gonna work. And so I just you know, went in and started writing courses, and I've been just, just doing that since. It's one of my operating principles, besides just wanting to really help people and, and make a difference, and, to me, I felt like what I was doing before, I was, it was fine. I was doing a good job at it and stuff, but it wasn't, I felt I could contribute so much more to society. I could help so many more people. I could take what I was really good at and make that the thing I do instead of just, oh yeah, let me close a bunch of like bug tickets and feature tickets on some random thing that may or may not get canceled, you know, but like actually build something that I really see people needing. So that was one thing. The other was, and you mentioned this at the start of this segment, I really, really wanted to stop trading time for money. Mm. Right. I, I mean, I was paid well for the job that I had been doing, but if I, for some reason wanted to go on vacation and I was up done with the amount of vacation I had, I did take unpaid leave. If I got sick or I wanted to go on, you know, just take some time away with the family, I got no more pay and I could have gone and done like a, another option could have, I could have gone and done consulting for more money, but then you're really being paid down to the minute for what you're doing. And I wanted to be able to create something of value and then put that out into the world and just com continue to build and build and build on it. And so that's what I've been doing. And you're right. Like, you know, I wake up in the morning and people have already bought stuff or I'll, I'll go skiing for three or four days, be out on the slopes, check. Oh yeah, great. Some, you know, sales came in today. Super. And then keep on like, it's, it's really been interesting to separate. I get up at eight. I'm paid to be in this, this desk for eight hours. And I, these are the things I do. And it's made me focus way more on being effective and efficient because no longer am I paid for time at a place I'm being paid only for what I create. Right. Yeah. So for example, I built courses that's, they were fine. I think they were interesting, but nobody really cared or wanted them. So I spilt, spent, you know, six weeks, a couple thousand dollars on editing transcripts, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing. And that's fine. Right. I mean, that's the risk you take or the trade-off you take because 
on the other side, you make stuff that people really like and it just keeps going, right? People are buying courses that I created, maybe slightly updated, but created three or four years ago and enjoying them. So it's, it's really neat because as if you can get that going, like each next thing you can do can kind of like layer on top of instead of mm-hmm. replace what you're getting. Whereas if you had a job, like you can really only just be doing the thing at a time, right? What project are you on or where are you focusing? And, but this is, is sort of, it accrues over time in really powerful ways. Yeah. I, I like, I really like the concept. I'm very inspired, like listening to you because I'm not sure who it said, like, like this kind of internet quote thingy all the time. I think Warren Buffett said it where if you don't earn money in your sleep, you will work your whole life. Yeah. And this is also something I personally don't want to do. And seeing you doing it with courses, like finding your niche and then providing people with value. It's like this, how I like to call it always, it's like the egoistic altruism where you are mm. egoistically want to make money, make a living, but also giving yeah. back to people. And I mean, your courses are not expensive. It's not like you're charging millions of dollars for a course. It's, it's very <laughs> yeah, affordable exactly. and it's top notch because I've, I've seen the courses and the audio is, for, is completely nice. Um, how you build the course and also the font isn't too small as you mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's you sit back, you're like, Oh, this, I'm not tired of looking at this after 10 minutes. And exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's just, I looked at all of the stuff that I thought was not working and I'm like, all right, let's, let's do this. But yeah, I, I don't know. There's a couple of things I, I did. Like I said, I had a pretty good job at the time. I had a good job at the time, but I wasn't inspired by it. And you know, I, I looked at, well, if I keep doing this for five years, where will I be? What, like, what position would I have in this yeah. company potentially? Yeah. And I thought, well, I don't really want that. I, I, that's not the path that I want to take. And then the other part was I thought about, well, what if I try this and it doesn't work? Right. I mean, maybe this is not advice for 2020, 2021. So keep it in mind, like in a more general, normal world, I thought, okay, well, if I try this, remember I had to quit my job. Um, and so if I quit my job and I try this and it doesn't work, what, what is the, what is the negative thing? So I had, I have kids, they were about to go into college, I had a mortgage. Like I, I wasn't just like a 20 something on a beach with, in Thailand with a very low price of living, right? I had like real expenses. So that there were consequences, but I thought, well, what if this doesn't work? Well, probably what's going to happen is I'm going to have to go and get a job again as a software developer. Thought, Wait a minute. If what, what's going to happen if it doesn't work is like where I am now. Yeah. Maybe I could try to reach a little bit higher. And if I just fall back to where I am, like how, how bad is that? That doesn't sound bad at all. Right. I mean, maybe, maybe my, I'd have to go to an office where I had to work a remote job before or something like that. But you know, that, that doesn't sound like a huge, penalty for trying something you really want to try to do if it doesn't work out yeah i love it i love it michael this is so cool Um, yeah it's that's great would you ever go back now let's say this whole talk python thing of course it it works now but if it wouldn't work would you still keep trying to find something some kind of where you build your own platform and try to sell it to other people just keep doing and keep digging oh boy i mean as a a father with kids I got to take care of and stuff. There's some limit where like, I'll just go back to work because I've got to just pay the bills. Like it's, I have to, but I would not do it willingly. Like I've, I've had Silicon Valley, you know, cool Silicon Valley companies reach out and say, you want a job? Like, uh, no, (laughs) no, I don't, I don't care how much money you offer me. I'm not going to go do that. I'm just not because it is so gratifying it is so amazing to to sort of be in control of your own destiny. So, you know, I, I can certainly see a, a path where like something completely fails with, you know, the, the company and I've got to for some reason do something else. But I would definitely try to do something like this again or try to create something else again and and just start over. Because, I mean, if I've got to go back to another job, I will, but I'm pretty broken. Like it's really really satisfied broken in like that. I can't just go sit in an office and close your tickets. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, it's, it's so inspiring to create your own thing and see it grow and, you know, have customers who really love what you're doing. Um, yeah. So 
Uh, the short the short answer is no, not unless I absolutely have to. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So, my, Michael, with that being said, I think we went over an hour, which is completely fine. I hope we have a second part maybe in the future. And tomorrow, yeah. uh, whenever this is coming out tomorrow, I'm on your show. Um, I'm really yes, you are. To You'll that. be on. So I have two two podcasts. I started yeah. Pyth- uh, Talk Python to me as a long form interview format. And I interview people all like I've actually had some engineering people on recently. I had a guy who is a mechanical engineer on an F1 team about how they switched from using like Excel to Python inside of some of the Formula One teams for all sorts of cool stuff they're doing. So that's the one podcast. And those are stories that are good for a long time. They're not timely. And usually they're kind of like, that would be good in a year from now for sure but i wanted to talk about news and what's happening like this week or what's happening now and so i instead of putting that together with another podcast that's supposed to have a long lifetime i created another one called python bytes which is like a weekly newsletter with analysis in the python space so yes you're going to be our special guest tomorrow that's going to be awesome nice and we'll talk about that right after this podcast yeah absolutely yeah we're going to live stream it so i don't know when this comes out but uh it'll be be out there yeah, let's like see. To, I'm really looking forward to it. The timing lines up. Yeah, yeah, really looking forward to it. I really enjoyed the podcast, Michael. We learned a lot. I learned a lot as well. Um, and also you inspired me and hopefully also the audience <laughs> at the end to uh, do something, maybe also do a job, but also reach out to other things that exist in life and find your own way, yeah. maybe your own path. So I thank you for that, Michael. Yeah, I, I feel, yeah, you're absolutely welcome. I feel like it's, it's, it's not necessarily something you do in your first five years in a a career, but at some point you'll be in some kind of specialized area and you'll just see like, why is this hard? Why is nobody solving this problem? It is so obvious to me how to solve it and no one's doing it. Like that's your opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. Why is nobody creating high quality videos just to teach people programming? Why is it always crummy and disjointed? And like, that was the opportunity. So I'm sure that can be replicated uh, in somebody else's vertical, no problem. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, Michael. Thanks a lot for your time and being on my show and see you tomorrow. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Nice chat with everyone. Bye.